of the CLTC department, security seminars. Um, and we're just thrilled to have Miku today, uh, co-hosted with the CLTC. Um, I wanted to get Miku to speak at a seminar for many, many uh, months now, um, and we finally got him when he's in the US. Uh, so Miko is a worldwide authority uh, in computer security. Uh, he's been working in at least the AV industry for many, many decades now at F-Secure, um, where he's currently the chief research officer. Um, he's written and he's consulted uh, and, and asked to speak and write for a variety of different sources that you might read, such as the New York Times, Scientific America, um, and he's appeared on a number of different media outlets. Um, and I could just go on and on, but uh, as Kristen said, uh, Miko has a flight to catch. All right, excellent. <laughs> Thank you very much, and thank you for having me here. It's my first time in Berkeley. I'm thrilled to be here. Unfortunately, it is a very, very short visit. But nevertheless, I'm really happy to be here and really happy to be meeting all you guys. So indeed, my name is Mikko. I've uh, spent my life working with computer security. I started programming as a 13-year-old, got into malware reverse engineering as an 18-year-old, and to remind myself of my background and where I'm coming from, I always travel with one of the early viruses I analyzed with. And there are people in the audience who really don't have quite good understanding what it is, I guess. <laughs> some of you have worked with these, but some of you haven't. And if you look back on how much this field has changed during the, well, the 26 years that I've spent in this industry, the difference could not have been bigger. Because when I started like hunting early virus writers and reverse engineering their viruses, it was sort of like a game. Like they were writing more complex viruses every day and then we would try to crack them and then we cracked them and we were so cool. And we, we, we were waiting for the next virus and then they created more viruses. Sort of like playing chess against an unknown enemy or unknown, unknown opponent. But today it's not a game. Clearly it's not a game. If someone would have told me in 1991, when I started working for this company where I still work today, that eventually our enemies will be foreign intelligence agencies, foreign militaries, organized crime, extremists. I would not have believed that. I wouldn't have believed it. The change has been so huge. And the, the pace of change isn't slowing down either. Our Opponents, our enemies keep changing all the time. We can expect this to be happening in the future as well. And that's why we have to think further. We have to think about the future. And that's why I'm really happy to be um, right now in an event which is co-hosted by CLTC. Because I've read some of the CLTC papers and the research is, is, is excellent. Those of you who are not familiar with CLTC, I recommend you look at some of their research. Especially the one looking at like, you know, the, the, the more distant future about the kinds of problems we might be running into, which I find very fascinating, especially discussions about how our privacy, a notion of privacy will change. One part of me thinks that we've already lost the war or the fight for privacy. I remember when we were still living in the offline world. But the youngest of you don't, or remember it very faintly. Like, you know, 20 years old don't remember the time before the web. For them, you know, Google has always been there. Wikipedia has always been there. And for them, it's perfectly natural. It's the only thing they've ever known that if you want to consume content, you pay for the content with your privacy. You pay for the content with your data. That's how we pay for YouTube videos that we watch. That's how we pay for the Google searches we do, or by spending time on Facebook. So they don't know, the 20 year olds don't know, they, they don't know about any other kind of world. And if that's the case, then we might have already lost the fight for privacy. And, and my generation, I was born in 1969, which means I'm older than the internet, all right? TCP IP was invented in December 1969. I was born in October 1969, so I'm officially older than the internet. My generation was the first generation that got online. We are the first generation who can be tracked you know, throughout our lives, everything we do. Where are we? Who are we close to? We are all in the same room right now, and our Reporting, reporting devices know this. I mean, our physical proximity is not known just to us, but to quite a few other parties. 
We can be tracked where we are, how we travel, who we're close to, who we communicate with, what do we communicate about, what do we like, what are our interests. And this change has been very quick. We are the you know, test subjects, the guinea bigs. We don't really understand what it means when our whole lives can be tracked. And we are about to find out because this change is happening right now. So we might have lost the fight for privacy, maybe. But I refuse to accept that we would have lost the fight for security as well. Fighting for security isn't easy. The attackers have the upper hand. You put yourself in the shoes of an attacker, you very quickly realize that they can spend as much time as they want to figure out how defenses work. Like if they want to break into some system or if they want to break the security of some type of a system, they'll just get an offline copy of that system and probe it, try to find weaknesses. They get copies of firewall systems or intrusion prevention systems or client security systems and try to find ways around them. And if you have unlimited time and just try different things, eventually you will find ways around any current protection systems we have. So the attackers have the luxury of time and we defenders do not have that luxury. Quite the op uh, opposite, we have to be able to find new attacks very quickly and to be able to defend against them very quickly. So this fight between malware writers and malware fighters isn't fair because they have access to our weapons. But that's the way it is. That's just the way it is. And our best bets in building defenses is to understand who we are fighting. The most important thing an organization can do to build their own defenses is to start with the threat assessment. Like, who are we? What are we doing? Who would be interested in us? Who would be interested in gaining access to our information? Because most organizations have a very abstract view of hackers. You know, evil hackers will try to break into our network. Evil hackers will want to steal our stuff. And they don't really understand the differences between different types of hackers because we have completely different kind of groups targeting different targets with different kind of attacks for different motivations, which means you fight them with different mechanisms. And not all attackers are after everybody. If you are faced with an attacker who's only interested in you, who's not interested in anyone else, but only interested in you or your organization, they will get in. They will just keep trying and keep trying different mechanisms until they, they get in. Most attackers aren't interested in just one target. Most attackers are after money. And criminal attackers who want money, they're actually very democratic in their attacks. They're not interested in any specific party. They just want to find someone where they can find something which is worth money. So if they can't get in somewhere, they go somewhere else. But when we look at, for example, foreign intelligence agencies, they have a target. That's their mission. And they will keep on trying until they gain access. So if someone really wants to gain access to your system, they will most likely do it. And this also means that the biggest companies on the planet are probably all breached. Because there's probably someone interested in any one of those companies. And when you have large enough network, you can't defend all of it at all times. So, how many of the Fortune 500 is hacked right now? And of course, that's a trick question. The answer is 500. <laughs> because every single one of those Fortune 500 companies are very large global companies with tens of thousands of workstations around the world. They can't possibly defend all of them at all times. Every single one of them has some bridge in their network. It might be a small bridge. It might be something which doesn't really matter, but they definitely all have something wrong in their systems right now. So if we have to start building our defenses by first understanding the attackers, then okay, who, who are the attackers? Or, or let's put it differently, who are the hackers? And I divide hackers into five different groups. Group number one, guys in tracksuits. <laughs> Some of you might know these guys. That's Charlie and that's Chris. Charlie Miller and Chris uh, Volosek. They are, uh, both of them are friends of mine. They're both hackers, but they're not evil hackers. 
They're good hackers, white hat hackers, guys who break security to improve security. You probably saw headlines these guys made two years ago when they broke the security of Chrysler cheap vehicles. And they did that to improve the security of our cars. When they broke those car systems, and they broke them well enough that they could actually remotely steer the cars or, or you know, break the car or floor the car. When they did all that research, they then took their research and went to Chrysler and told Chrysler everything they've done. And then they told Chrysler that, by the way, we're going to tell the world in the next Black Hat, which is in six months. So you now have six months to fix your stuff. And that's exactly what Chrysler did. They fixed it. And we're all safer. In fact, all cars are safer today thanks to the kind of work these guys did. So they are hackers, but they're the good kind of hackers. They're the kind of hackers you want to have on your side. Group number two, people who actually do break the law, but they don't break the law to gain something for themselves. So hacktivists or hacker activists, movements like the Anonymous. Yes, they do break into servers, they write malware, they write botnets, they launch denial of service attacks, but they don't do it to gain something for themselves. They do it for some kind of a higher cause. They might have a political motive or a protest motive or something like that. And the fact that they're not looking for personal gain makes them different from group number three, which is criminals, money-making criminals and organized crime. And this is the biggest group. Out of the five groups I'm showing here, this is where most of the attacks are coming from. Now, the company I work for, where I've worked for now for 26 years, we run virus labs around the world. So we use machine learning systems to collect large amounts of samples. Then we have our machines try to figure out if they're good or bad files or good or bad programs and then block them accordingly. And those systems, um, we collect around 400,000 samples every single day, many of which we collect ourselves automatically by having our, our well, by running large networks of vulnerable systems which go and surf the net, click on every link with IE6, with old version of Java and Flash. And as you might expect, they get hit by malware. And they also get tons of email all the time because they've left their email addresses all over the web and they open up every attachment. So our honey nets and our Honey monkeys. Honey monkeys are what we call our active systems, which browse the web and click on links. Whenever they get infected, we collect samples from them and we throw them into our back end. That creates most of those 400,000 samples we receive every day. And out of that sample flow, we estimate that 98% is coming from group number three. So criminals. This is by far the biggest problem, especially in the malware world. And they make their money with banking trojans, credit card keyloggers, ransom trojans, different kinds of botnets. And then we have group number four, that's governments. The very first governmental case that I worked with was in 2003, so 14 years ago. And that was the Chinese. And the target in that very first case was a defense contractor. In that particular case, one employee at one defense contractor and that employee was their uh, vice president of R&D. And his personal laptop had been infected with a backdoor for over a year, something like 13 months, 14 months, before we realized what was, what was going on. And during those 14 years, we've analyzed thousands of governmental cases from the Chinese, from the Russians, from North Korea, from Iran, from United States of America, from United Kingdom, Today, pretty much every single government is involved, not just in building defense, but also building offense. That's quite clear. And we are in the beginning of the next arms race. We spent 60 years in the nuclear arms race. We're sort of out of that now. And as soon as we got out of that, we jumped into next, to the next arms race, which is the cyber arms race. And I know the word cyber, or the term cyber is very very different for some people, but some people still define, I mean, I, I remember the time when cyber used to mean cyber sex. That's what cyber meant in 1990s. So nowadays I find it hilarious when I hear like generals and colonels speak about how they have to do more cyber. But, uh, <laughs> they mean different kind of cyber. 
Nevertheless, we are in the beginning of an arms race. And it might very well be that this arms race goes on for the next 60 years, just like the last arms race went on for 60 years. And it's going to take a long while until we get into discussion, discussions of things like, I don't know, cyber disarmament and rules of law for cyber war, things like that. But most of the things that the governments do right now are not about waging war. The vast majority of governmental attacks are about espionage or sabotage. In fact, the vast majority is espionage. Then we have some sabotage cases. And then we have a couple of outliers, like North Korea doing the SWIFT attack in order to steal money from other governments. Like there's very few governments in the planet which are so desperate that they resort to stealing money from other governments. But then again, North Korea is printing fake US dollars already. So it's, like, it's, it's not that far-fetched. And they actually did that. But those are outliers. The vast majority of cases we see are espionage cases. So whenever the news media writes about these cases, they love using the term cyber war, which is obviously wrong in espionage cases, because espionage is espionage. Spying is spying. Espionage and spying are not war. And when governments use offensive cyber power to do espionage, we shouldn't be calling it cyber war, because cyber war is a word we will be needing for real cyber war. And we have a couple of examples that in my book are already examples of cyber war. Maybe the best example from four or five months ago, the attacks happening during the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, which of course Russia doesn't call a war, but it is a war. Like when you take a piece of land from another country, I mean, what else do you call it? <laughs> Nevertheless, in that conflict, we've seen several Uh, online attacks. Most important in my book is not the Prukarbato Oblenergo attack. Prukarbato Oblenergo was the power company which was hacked, which then turned off power from hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian citizens. I think more interesting is the attack which was done against Ukrainian soldiers through their phones, through their Android phones, which were infected with Russian-made malware, which then pinpointed their GeoIP back to Russia after which artillery shots were shot into the location of the soldiers. So, when soldiers start dying because their phones get infected, I have a hard time defining that any, as anything else than cyber war. I mean, that's what it looks like. It's not about espionage, it's about like, real stuff which has a kinetic outcome. And cyber is just one domain for waging war. We started with land war a long, long time ago. We expanded into sea war, then air war, then space war with satellites and stuff, and now the cyberspace war. And none of these are waged by themselves. It's typically a combination of different domains. So that's the first four. What's the last group? Well, that's an upcoming group. That's extremists. Extremists and terrorists. And let me be clear, we haven't seen cyber terrorism yet. But we might. And this is a very worrying thought. Because for all the other groups, we sort of understand their motivations. We can see why they're doing what they're doing. But we can't really understand what extremists are doing. We don't really understand their motivations with their real world attacks either. Or, or like, we don't understand what they're doing. So these, would, these online attacks by uh, extremists could create really problematic situations. Because they would be the only group which would be willing to do attacks which make no sense. Um, for example, imagine things like writing a self-replicating version of some industrial control system worm which would infect different factories and power plants and then just do random modifications. That's perfectly doable. None of these groups would be interested in doing that except group number five. So that's what I mean by unpredictable attacks. But like I said, group number three, criminals, that's where most of the stuff is coming from. Criminals. Criminals like these guys. Here on the left, Denis Kalovskis from Latvia, the guy behind the Gozi uh, banking Trojan operation. In the center, Vilja Kivi from Estonia, who's running fairly large-scale phishing scams. Both Denis and Vilja are in jail right now. They were both arrested and sentenced. But the guy on the right is not. He's still on the loose. His name is uh, Yev Yev Yevgeny Bogachev. He's from Moscow. Um, you can actually find him from the Interpol Most Wanted pages, where he's wanted for 
running the zoo, spanking Trojan, botnet, um, selling exploit kits online. And based on this photo, he's probably also wanted for crimes against fashion. <laughs> like, what the hell is that? <laughs> so money-making attacks online are really the biggest problem. But they're also a very democratic problem. I mean, criminals, for example, let's say credit card thieves who, who use keyloggers to gain access to your credit cards, they don't really care where the victims are. Like, if they get an American credit card or, you know, a Swiss credit card or Italian credit card or Japanese credit card, it doesn't matter. They get credit cards. So they target everybody. So the, the criminals, in most cases, are very, very uh, not picky with their targets, unlike, for example, governmental attacks. And when we look at the biggest growing business for online criminals, it is ransom trojans. This has been the case for the last five years. During the last five years, uh, we've, we've seen the growth of ransom trojan business. And it's always the same. Your laptop gets infected, they encrypt your files, then they demand payment in Bitcoin. And if you pay, they deliver. They will decrypt your files. So at least they are honest criminals. But they have to be honest, because they know they have to have a good reputation. They have to have a reputation that they deliver the goods. Because otherwise nobody would pay the ransom. So they do deliver the goods. We know this because we often you know, like test infect our systems and then we communicate with these guys because they run support systems. You can actually they have support chat, they have support email, support forums. We've, and, and we've haggled, we've tried this. Like, okay, the, the uh, ransom is one Bitcoin, which is $1,000. And we're like, oh no, we don't have $1,000. Could we like 500 maybe? And they're like, uh, 900. We're like, no, 700. And then we, we, we agree on 800 or something like that. So if you get infected with Ransom Trojan and you don't have backups, haggle. You can actually haggle. It works. For most of these gangs, it works. We published one research paper on this, on actually trying this with different gangs. 92% um, I think of the gangs were willing to haggle. So it works. But of course, it would be even better to have the backups so you wouldn't have to pay the ransom. And not just backups of your computer, because all of these try to encrypt your network drives as well. So they will mount all the shares you can see and then they will encrypt all the files you can write on those shares. So from your point of view that means that if your laptop gets infected it's going to encrypt your Dropbox. Because Dropbox is a file share that you can write to. So they're going to overwrite everything here and everything in your Dropbox or whatever cloud you have if your cloud solution is something that can be mounted as a drive. If you work at a company it's going to mount every single network drive at your company and it's going to overwrite all the files you can write to which is really bad. So it's not just about backing up this, it's also backing up everything else. And we also must remember that backups are not backups until you have tried the restore, right? Before that, there are Schrodinger's backups, right? You have to actually try that you can restore the data. So backup, backs, backups are the solution really for this problem if you can't prevent from getting infected. So how do you get infected? Well, you get infected by, for example, something like this. This is a CV from Cameron Chandler, who's looking for a job at your organization and sent his CV to your recruitment people or to your HR people. And he looks fairly trustworthy, right? No, who wouldn't trust this guy? And his CV is pretty neat. It has active content. This resume has active content. Please click enable content. And when you click the button, it actually works. You get, you know, his education. He studied at the University of Washington. And you're infected by now. The button, this enable content button, present in Microsoft Word, Excel and PowerPoint, really is mislabeled. It really shouldn't be called enable content. It should be called infect my system. Because <laughs> that's what it does. I mean, this really, it, what it means is that this document has embedded macros. Run the macros with the privileges of the currently logged in user. That means like run a program, basically. It can create a program, drop it on your hard drive and execute it. It can do whatever it wants. And macros are very rarely used for anything else than badness. So if there's one thing I want you to remember out of this talk today, if there's one thing you'll remember, I want that thing to be don't click enable content. <laughs> okay? Don't click it. And to make this more confusing, Microsoft Word and Excel and PowerPoint have very similar buttons which are not as bad. For example, you might see a button which says enable editing. 
That actually shows up in every Office document which you download from the web. You have a button called Enable Editing. And clicking that is kind of OK. It's not going to run macros. But clicking Enable Content is practically always a bad idea. Now, ransom trojans are typically dropped with a trick like this or with web-based exploit kits. And one thing we have to understand about ransom trojans is that these are actually being developed by completely different gangs, which actually compete with each other. We're tracking over 100 different gangs right now. In fact, we just released a uh, research paper yesterday, our threat report, which, in which we have made this sort of like a tube map of like the last five years of ransom trojans. I can't actually even fit it on my slides because the, the full map looks like this. <laughs> so there's, you know, hundreds of different gangs competing for the same customers or the same victims. They all try to find people to infect so they can encrypt their computer and their network drives and demand bitcoins to get their files back. And the mega trend behind this problem, of course, is bitcoin. Because now they have a way of getting the money without getting caught. Which doesn't mean that Bitcoin is bad, because it isn't bad. But it's a tool. Just like, you know, real world criminals prefer cash, online criminals prefer Bitcoin. But I think the most important, or maybe the most interesting development I've seen recently with Ransom Trojans, we found last month. It's a new gang. And by the way, not all of these gangs are from Russia. Some of them are from Ukraine. <laughs> I may be exaggerating, but only slightly, okay? So this one, which is a Russian malware, we found this uh, maybe two months ago. We call it the popcorn ransom trojan. It infects your system, uh, encrypts your files, demands one Bitcoin, which is $1,060. Now you can imagine that, you know, you know, some home user gets hit by this and her photos are encrypted and her email history is encrypted. She has no backups and she doesn't have $1,060 to pay. In that case, the, Trojan offers for you to get your files back for free. You get your files back for free if you infect two of your friends. <laughs> and this is brilliant. This really is, I mean, this is like combining pyramid scams with ransom Trojans or, or chain letters with ransom Trojans. That's, that's really clever. I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to be angry at these guys when they're so creative. <laughs> And this means that you, know, you can see the first victim who doesn't have $1,000 to pay infect two other victims. And they infect two other victims. And they infect two other victims. It becomes exponential. This is, uh, it, it, it is a, a very effective way of spreading the infection. And I know what you're thinking. I'll, you, I'll make two virtual machines and infect them. That's not enough. You have to infect two victims and they have to pay the ransom. Then when two of the victims you've, you have infected pay the ransom, it will automatically unlock your files. So it actually works. It delivers what it says. It gives you a unique URL. You'll just spread that URL and if people get infected and pay, you get decrypted for free. I don't recommend this, of course, but it does work. I don't recommend paying the ransom either, but of course we know that many, many companies do. I even know of companies like large companies which have prepared themselves uh, according to their continuity, business continuity principles, which means they've actually set up Bitcoin wallets with Bitcoin in them just for the chance that one of their employees gets infected. So they are ready to pay the ransom and carry on working. And I can sort of see why they're doing that. But it, of course, at the same time, makes this problem worse. Because the more money these guys make, the bigger the problem is. So let's talk about money. How much money are these guys making? This is Yevgeny Nikulin. Yevgeny is right now under arrest in Prague, which is in Czech Republic. Yevgeny himself is from Moscow, but he was on holiday with his girlfriend in Prague, enjoying his uh, lifestyle, because he's a fairly rich guy, because he was the guy who stole 170 million uh, email addresses and passwords from LinkedIn in 2012. He hasn't been sentenced on that yet, but that's what he was arrested for. He will be extradited to the United States and we'll, we'll get the full details eventually. Now, we know that Yevgeny wasn't actually using that database himself uh, to, you know, ha hack into people's accounts. He was basically selling that 170 million password collection to other hackers. He did it for four years uh, until he was, was caught last year. So the question is, how much money did he make? How much money did Yevgeny make by selling this collection of 170 million LinkedIn passwords? And I don't know how much he made, but we did find his um, 
social media accounts and some videos of his hobbies from YouTube. And on those YouTube videos, you can see that he's, he's speaking about his hobbies because his hobby is um, sports cars. Mm -hmm. That's a Lamborghini Huracan on the right. That's an Audi R8 on the left. This is the ring road which goes around Moscow city. And from his Instagram, we can see that he also has a Mercedes Benz, an Aston Martin, a Porsche and a Rolex and a goddamn Rolls Royce. <laughs> so how much money did he make? I don't know, but he made enough. When you drive a Rolls Royce in Moscow and you're 29 years old, no. Of course, the good part is that he's not enjoying any of that anymore because he's in custody right now. And this then creates the next question. Okay, if people are willing to pay so much money for, for that database, how are they making money out of it? Well, one thing we know for a fact that this database was used for is that the attackers, like other hackers, would buy the database. Then they would search through this list of 170 million email addresses looking for Gmail addresses or other webmail addresses. All right. Then they would take the LinkedIn password and try logging into that Gmail account with the same password. Now we've actually asked people about their password usage and around 10% of people say that they use one password. And that doesn't mean that they would use one password, the password manager. It means that they have one password. They use the same password everywhere, which is a horrible idea. So let's have a very conservative estimate here and say that, you know, 10% of those LinkedIn passwords would work on Gmail as well. So 170 million accounts, let's say 10% of them are Gmail, that's 17 million accounts. And if 10% of those have the same password on LinkedIn and Gmail, you end up with 1.7 million Google accounts. 1.7 million Google accounts. That's a conservative assumption. All right, so what's next? Well, now they have access to 1.7 million Google accounts, including Gmail. Well, next they would go to these victims' email archive and search for old emails. Because Gmail never deletes mails. So if you have an email from like eight years ago, it's still there and they can still find it. And they're searching for a particular type of email. They're searching for those emails that you get when you register for the first time to an online store. So if you register to any random store years ago, there's still an email about that in your archive and they will find it. And they know that this Gmail account has an account in that online store. And of course, next they will go and try to log into the online store using the same password. And even if the password doesn't work, if the user has a different password, it doesn't matter. It's already game over because Gmail has become the single sign-on system for the web. Because they would go to the online store and if the password doesn't work, then they will click the magic button. Because every single login page has a magic button. And that magic button is called, I have forgotten my password. And you click the magic button and then the online store is going to send you a new password to, to your Gmail, which they already have. So they can gain access to every online store. Which means they can start ordering stuff as you. If you've saved your payment information, now they start ordering iPads and laptops and Xboxes as gift shipments. So they're not coming to you, they're going to some of their mules. This is what we see them do. Another big revolution which is underway right now is the next internet. The internet of things. Not just computers going online, but everything else going online as well. Now watch carefully, that's a nuclear reactor. This is what a nuclear reaction <coughs> looks like. I think that's kind of cool. Let me actually play that again. It's, it's so cool. That is a nuclear reactor. Next we'll see a nuclear reaction. Why am I showing you a nuclear reaction? Because it's an example of the kind of real world things which are being controlled by computers and software. Because all factories and all power plants are being controlled by computers and software. Of course they are. What else? Factory automation started already from the 1950s. Computer-based factory automation from the late 1960s. IoT revolution started from factories. Now it's coming to our homes. And this is now a big shift for us mentally because I'm a computer security guy. I am a computer security 
guy. For years and years, I thought that my job is to secure computers. I'm a computer security guy, I secure computers. And now we've woken up and realized that computers and software run the whole society. Everything. Lights are on here in this building because of computers and software. The lunch we just had was at least partially made in a food processing plant, which is running on computers and software. Every com company, every company today is a software company. So we, computer security people, you, computer security people, our job is not to secure computers. Our job is to secure the society, because the whole society runs on computers. And it's about time we understand that. Now, I'm hopeful regarding IoT. I want to be hopeful regarding IoT. The way I think about it is that when internet came around, internet exposed us to new risks, new kinds of risks. People who couldn't reach us, bad people who were too far away, who couldn't reach us before the internet now could reach us. Like Yevgeny, he's in Moscow. He couldn't have hurt us here in California before the internet. Now he probably stole most of your passwords because most of you were using LinkedIn in 2012 when he had been. But I think we would all agree, especially being in the middle of Silicon Valley, I think we would all agree that the internet brought more good things than bad things. It exposed us to bad things, but there's so much more good than bad that, you know, the good things outweigh the bad things. And I'd like to think that IoT is going to be the same. That a decade from now we will look back to the history of IoT and we'll see that IoT exposed us to completely new kinds of risks. But the, there were so many good things it brought that the good things outweighed the bad things. But this is just wishful thinking. We actually don't know if that's going to happen. I'm hoping, I'm wishing it's going to happen. Right now it doesn't look very good. Right now we see tons of problems. Problems like people installing their home automation systems and then ending up putting them online with no username or password. Or factories implementing complete factory automation systems and having them exposed over remote control VNCs with no username and password. Or a power plant being online and that actually is the power plant's fire control system online with no username and password. That's the button you press if you want to fill the power plant with foam. <laughs> and this is a bad idea. And then we have the problem of IoT botnets. Mirai has been in the headlines ever since it was found in October. Mirai is Japanese for the future. And maybe this is the future of IoT. The single largest denial of service attack in the history of the internet was launched from this botnet. And the way the botnet was created was trivial. Completely trivial. The way Mirai finds new IoT devices to infect is that it just scans IP addresses and whenever it finds an IoT device, it uses default credentials to log into those systems. That's it. And to make matters worse, it doesn't just try logging into them. Um, it all, it, the protocol it uses to log into them is not SSH. It's not HTTPS. It's using goddamn Telnet. Telnet. Like our brand new IoT devices have Telnet D running. What? Like, I mean, there's a prime example of the kinds of problems we already solved. Like you look at any recent system on our computers, we aren't running Telnet because Telnet is a horrible idea. We got rid of Telnet in 1990s. But for some reason we have to apparently repeat the same mistakes on our new IoT devices. Telnet is completely unencrypted. You log into any of these devices over Wi-Fi, anyone else in the same Wi-Fi can just pick up your password from the air. Not even obfuscated, it's completely plain text. Another good example of the mistakes that we are repeating with IoT is that we, we aren't building auto-update to these systems. Your automated kitchen will you know, eventually be completely out of date because there's no auto-update mechanism for the firmware. And even the kernels, because all of, all of this is based on Linux. The kernel, Linux kernels they're using are typically like three versions old and there's no way to update that. And that's another problem we solved years ago on our computers. So right now, from where I'm looking at this, the Internet of Things is a clear and present danger to the Internet itself. So, you might have heard the saying, the data is the new oil. And this is absolutely true. 
Let's look at Google. We all use Google. Google Search, YouTube, Google Docs. Now we don't pay a cent. Yet Google made 80 billion last year in revenue out of those free services, which makes them larger than most oil companies on the planet. So yeah, absolutely it's true. Data is the new oil. Another way in which it's very similar is that, that oil is something that has brought the mankind a lot of prosperity and a lot of problems. A lot of problems like global warming and polluting the nature. And exactly in the same way, data will bring us prosperity and it will bring us problems. And this, the fact that data is the new oil is nicely illustrated in IoT. When people learn about problems with IoT, one typical reaction I hear is that, you know, I hate IoT. I'm never going to buy an IoT device. Well, you know what? You won't have a choice. Very soon you go to an appliance store to buy a home appliance. Every single home appliance will be IoT appliance. Even the ones which don't really need the internet for anything at all. Because those will be using the internet not to benefit you, the, the consumer, but to benefit the manufacturer. So you can imagine going and buying a toaster. And of course a toaster doesn't need internet. I mean you don't really need a push message to your phone that the toast is done. You, know, you don't really need internet for the toaster. Eventually even those will be online. Because data is the new oil. The manufacturer wants to know how often their toasters are being used. How many customers do we have? Where are our customers? How often do they toast? How often do we have failures with our devices? Do we have more customers? in Stanford or Berkeley. And if we have more customers in Berkeley, maybe we should advertise around Stanford more. You know, things like data is the new oil. This is going to happen. And this is going to happen because internet will be everywhere and because that single chip which will provide the connectivity for our IoT devices will eventually cost 10 cents or 5 cents, which means the benefits don't have to be very large for vendors to do this. So you will not be able to avoid the IoT revolution. It's going to happen whether you like it or not. Because it might not be coming to benefit you, it will be coming to benefit the vendors. And if you're working with oil, you have to worry about oil leaks. If you're working with data, you have to worry about data leaks. But if you remember one thing about what I told you today, I want that one thing to be, don't click enable content. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll take a couple of questions, please. Do you need to enter your Wi-Fi password to get these IoT devices online? Please repeat. Would you not have to enter your ah, Wi-Fi right, yeah. password to get these IoT devices online? No, because 5G. They will not be going online with your Wi-Fi. They will be going online with future technologies, LTE M or 5G or something like that. F of course, if it wants to use your Wi-Fi, then you have to give it the password, but it doesn't have to use it. And that 5G chip will cost 10 cents. One day it will. Yes? Yeah, the business dogma around startups is move fast and break things, do things that don't scale, um, you know, build minimally viable products. How can you convince business people that like security matters in this kind of framework? Simple, to make them liable for the problems they create. Which is a really simple solution and very hard to do in practice. And I'm very divided about this myself because I work for a software company. And, and the part of me that works with security and privacy would really love software companies to be liable for their products. And the part of me that gets my paycheck from a software company hates the idea of being liable for any of that. And we're trying to be a really responsible company, but even if you go and read our end user license agreement, we deny any liability for anything we do. Like, you know, if our software crashes and burns and destroys all your files, we will not refund you in any way. We don't even have to fix it. We actually say that in our agreements, which is horrible. No, but we do, like everyone else. I think this is especially relevant, once again, to IoT. Um, imagine yourself going and buying a washing machine. You get it home with today's regulations and certifications, you can be fairly certain that, you know, it's not going to give you an electric shock. It has underwriter laboratory stamp, it has the CE certification, 
It's not going to give you an electric shock. It's very unlikely. It's also not going to, I don't know, get a short circuit and catch fire and burn down your house. But more importantly, if it have a short circuit and if it catches fire, if it burns down your house, the vendor who made the washing machine is liable. They have to, they are, they are liable for your house burning down. But if it's an IoT washing machine and it leaks your home Wi-Fi password, and then every computer in your house in the morning is encrypted with a ransom trojan, now suddenly they are not liable. And I think that's not right. I think the only way we can force IoT vendors to invest money into the security of their IoT devices is to somehow regulate it. And I'm not a fan of regulation, but we already regulate everything else about our appliances. We probably should be regulating that as well by making them liable for the damages their poor security causes. Because IoT vendors don't want to invest money into cybersecurity because the most important selling point for washing machines is the price. Nobody's asking for security features. When you go and buy a washing machine, you don't ask questions about firewalls and intrusion prevention systems. You just don't. You ask how much is it? That's the number one question. So vendors would be stupid to spend money into something that nobody's asking for and which would increase the price, which is the most important selling point. So the only way we can make them do it is by forcing them to do it. Last question. Last question in the back row. Um, you argue that uh, having some sort of automatic update mechanism for IoT would be beneficial, but um, wouldn't that put the um, weak link on the update servers? You know, hackers could go after update servers, push a malicious update, and then you know, there's no way to get that back. Yes and no. Uh, of course, we, we know how to do updates securely. Look at Microsoft Windows updates, the biggest botnet on the planet, basically. But it's never been hacked. Well, actually, it has been hacked once. But that was US government, so it doesn't count. <laughs> I'm referring to the flame case. You, you can look it up if, if you're interested. Nevertheless, um, I mean, if you encrypt, if you sign your updates, if you encrypt the updates system, if you double check everything, the only way to gain access would be to like, hack the backend servers and you can try to protect them as your crown jewels. But why, well, what makes this more problematic is that you know, appliances have life cycles. Those companies won't be around forever. What happens with the servers? What happens with the domain names? Because we expect to be able to use our washing machine for you know, decades. And, and, and this is maybe the more, more uh, pressing problem. And we probably don't have perfect answers like we don't have perfect answers to anything in computer security. And for that, I want to thank you for your work. Thank you very much. Uh, a small gift for you. Thank, thank you very you much. Thank you so much for coming to talk. I hope it's booze. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you.